and I'm sure this extremely interesting paper called Keep Calm and Carry On, inspired by the English uh, approach to life, I guess, um, <laughs> on the short versus long run effects of mindfulness meditation on academic performance. So Leah joins us from um, University of Regensburg near Munich, and we're so pleased to have her here with us in person in Oxford. So Leah, over to you, and thank you for the time and the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much really for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with the expert of, uh, of well-being. I have presented this paper many times, but only in front of economists, and now I have a room full of many different scientists, so I must say that makes me a little bit nervous. But uh, I hope you will, uh, you will enjoy the presentation. So, you already introduced this joint work with Mira Fischer from Berlin and, from, and with Vanessa Valero from Grossboros um, University. So, um, I guess I uh, can be quick on, on what mindfulness is, but just to make sure that we're all in the, on the same place. As you probably know, mindfulness is coming from, has origins in the Asian traditions uh, and philosophy, and has been, let's say, recently uh, became more popular in the Western, uh, including in companies and in education. So, how do I understand mindfulness? We all are going to use, of course, a different definition has been given. Here, I'm going to use the one given by one of the fathers of the mindfulness, uh, so by John kabat which says, paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So as you can see in the picture, it's like a, you sit in a meditation position, you close your eyes, and you focus your attention on an object of interest, which could be your breath, your thoughts, um, your emotions, a mantra, etc. So now this mindfulness meditation is becoming increasingly uh, popular, including in firms. And here we have not only the usual suspect like Google, but we have also more traditional companies like Deutsche Telekom. So it's really, it's really booming. And not only in, uh, in companies, but also in education. Here I brought this example, which as far as I understand, I think this refers to the uh, RCT that you're mentioning by Laura Taylor. Exactly. So I was actually going to ask you, do you know what happened to this? Uh, to this mental health uh, trial, because I think it must have also overlapped with COVID. So anyway, you know about this initiative that uh, the British government announced in February 2019, that uh, in almost 400 schools, they will start pra practicing mindfulness education, which I found extremely exciting and uh, wonderful to hear. So yes, and also it's not only a school, but in fact, in many top universities in the US and the UK, they're already promoting mindfulness courses for their students, including in Oxford. And they're also in MBAs and business courses actually called on mindful leadership, such as at HBS, NYU Stern, MIT, etc. So we all know that the in fact extensive evidence that mindfulness meditation training is very effective in achieving its main goal, mainly in reducing stress, anxiety, and depression which we all know it's very important. Uh, also prior COVID, thanks COVID has helped putting this into the, into the, the or making us realize perhaps even more how important it is to take care of our mental health. Um, however, little is known uh, yet still, I think, on the potential spillover that these practices, that mindfulness meditation might have on other important like outcome, such as academic performance. And so we address this question in a field experiment in an educational setting. So the question is, how does mindfulness meditation training affect students' academic performance in higher education? And surprisingly, as I mentioned, very limited evidence so far. Now, what could be happening? So on the one hand, you might say that given that previous study has shown that mindfulness meditation reduced anxiety and depression, which are typically found to be negative associated with academic performance by reducing anxiety and depression, I can increase uh, academic performance. Another channel could be that mindful meditation can, has been shown to improve self-control and focus, both of which are pretty useful for learning. So there are good reasons to believe that mindfulness meditation might have a, um, a positive impact on academic performance, which is presumably why some universities actually advertise it. So if you go to the Cambridge stage, uh, they say mindfulness supports you to study and write. So kind of, you know, you hit two birds with one stone, you, you get healthier, and you're also more productive. Um, so I guess that, that's, that's the hope. However, um, there could also be reasons for why um, 
mindfulness training might in fact have a negative effect on academic performance. First of all, while the relationship between anxiety and depression and the performance is purely negative, the relation between stress and performance is less trivial. I mean, there is not a lot of evidence that shows causality, and there have also been theories which, which would predict that the relationship between stress and performance is actually inverted due. You could say, of course, if it's too much stress, you have a burnout, you don't perform well, but perhaps a little bit of stress is not bad. It gives a little bit of pressure to work. So it all depends on where the students are, which level of stress do they start with. Second, mindfulness meditation may shift uh, or may change your motivation to study because the definition is you have to focus on your present moment and therefore you're not so much aroused anymore by future outcomes. You just think about being present and you're not so interested in achieving goals in the future. So let's say that mindfulness can hinder uh, goal, uh, this goal achievement process. As some authors have recently uh, mentioned in, um, in, in the paper 2018. And finally, as a third, as a third reason, you may say that you know learning a new practice, mindfulness meditation, and adopting new habits, new daily routine, because of course, if you don't do this regularly, it won't really help, might take away uh, resources in terms of cognitive effort um, and in terms of time, which may take which can be competing with studies so rather than employing in using these resources to study, you use it for learning new practice. So in this case, you could expect that at least in the short run, there could be some negative effect, which I know then will disappear once you have learned the practice and you have integrated these daily habits into your life. So there are also reasons for negative spillovers. Of course, uh, everybody is free to interrupt me anytime if you have, if you have questions. Um, so, given this difference, in fact, it's difficult to predict ex ante. So, to the best of our knowledge, we think this is our first study, uh, pre register study in relatively large or randomized control trial investigating the causal effect of an eight week mindfulness meditation training on short, a short term, I mean immediate, right after the end of the of the of the trial of the intervention, and then long term, by long term, I mean six months uh, on academic performance. But I might be wrong, so if you know other papers will do that in a relatively large sample size, please tell me. Uh, that, that's, that would be great. And so, what is our intervention? So, the, in the treatment, so basically, we advertise through the university administration this course to the oldest student of the social science and the faculty of Cologne. And then, um, those who got randomly assigned a place. They were in the treatment group, so they did this mindfulness training called MDSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction Course, which is a secular course standardized uh, and it has been evaluated by really hundreds of studies. And you can find it everywhere. You can Google it, MDSR Oxford, and you're probably going to find the course, uh, which is about 400 euros uh, per person for, for the entire course. So we, we used that, that, that course, um, which comprised, in, the, in our case, eight weekly one-hour sessions with a certified meditation teacher and independent exercise three times a day. It took place in the summer semester of 2019 at the University of Cologne, and it was sponsored by a major German health insurance, which also chose the, the teachers and organized everything. And then we had a control group, which are the people who applied for the course but did not get the spots. Uh, for which we have no intervention. So we don't have a, an active control group for a practical reason that we could not advertise an invitation course and then say, well, you don't get this, but you get a cooking course. So we just thought, in this case, it was very difficult to, to have an active control group. So uh, the control group has no intervention. We got an ethical approval. And so, and then, very important, we obtained approval from participants to use their great information from administrative records. So we got the grades directly from the administration, which is great because, of course, we limit the demand effects that the one would have. What is the timeline? Basically, uh, beginning of April, we uh, advertise the course with this general email that was sent. Uh, then we allocate the people to the treatment. And then in the beginning of May, the courses started. It lasted eight weeks, so it's just a week uh, of break in between for the pandemic of solidarity. Then it was over in uh, basically January, July, and it was, it was followed up by a survey. Um, uh, by the way, I should mention that the same survey was, was also run when people had to apply. So in order to apply, they had to fill a short questionnaire, which they had again to fill after the intervention. Also, the control group had to do that because we paid them only after they had uh, filled the course. 
And then the exam period, the first exam period of the summer semester starts for three weeks. Then there's a break, and then there's another semester, and then there is the exam period of the winter semester. And we're going to use basically these two main exam periods as our outcome. What are the data that we have? So I already mentioned we have great information about the administrative records of all the grades, also the grades done, also the grades of the exam done before the intervention. Also, you know how many ECTS points uh, the student had and uh, which, uh, which study program, which semester, etc. And then we, in the questionnaire, which was run again baseline and endline, we elicited mental health using psychologically validated skills. So we elicited stress, anxiety, and depression. Then we elicited cognitive skills for the stroke task. I'm not sure if you know that it is an attention task is meant to measure focus. So the, uh, a word appear, which means, whose meaning, for example, is green, but the color is red, and you have to be able to, and they ask you what is the meaning of a word, and you need to be somehow very happy to answer correctly. And it was incentivized, so they got money for each right answer that they did. Then we did the non-cognitive skills, in particular self-control, uh, neuroticism, and conscientiousness. And then we uh, elicited self-reported behavior, in particular study behavior, how much they concentrate, whether they use particular learning strategy, the self-concept, so if they felt confident in studying, then health behavior, or rather self-care practices, like whether they drink a lot of coffee, when they go to bed, uh, etc alcohol use, etc. And of course, data about meditation practice and then some, de some demographics. Now, uh, as I said, our main outcome is the exam grade. Uh, in particular, we use the um, average grades. So the grade that you get in exam multiplied by the number of points of the exam gives you. So the, the, the weight, so we don't like the number of points. Uh, in the main uh, summer semester and also in the main winter semester, the, that which were the, the regular exam phase. But of course, as you all know, there are also some, uh, exams sometimes in between. So there are also exams that are done here in the secondary period and in the midterms. I'm also going to show you the results for those, but these are our main outcome variable, which we also were registered. Um, as I said, the participants uh, are students from the Visa faculty of the University of Cologne. It was advertised to all the students. We received 282 applications, so people who completed most of the entire survey. We had to exclude some of those because they didn't meet some criteria. And um, among those who were, who were left, we, we had only uh, 102 spots because that was the budget that, we, that the, the health insurance gave us. So we randomly allocated people to this um, into the into whether they would get the spot or not. So 102 participants got the spot. So we created six meditation group of 17 participants, and then there were 122 students in the control group for a total temporal size of 224. I'm going to tell you about the characteristics a uh, little bit in more details. So I, I would be ready. If there are no questions about the design, or if you want, you can ask me later to tell you about the results already. So I'm going to go a little bus check. You have to believe me. All the variables are balanced across treatments uh, and also um, um, and also uh, treatment and questionnaires. It was also partly was by random. So it was like construction they were balanced because we re-randomized, even if it a small sample size, we re-randomized the allocation for the treatment to make sure that people would be um, that the two samples would be balanced along the observable characteristics. So you couldn't do that based on previous grade because we only got grades after the intervention, but we were lucky enough to see that it was balanced into another dimension. So they are balanced. I have them in the appendix if you want. Yes. Did you only pay the treatment group? For what do you mean? So I mean, there was some financial. Oh, that was no, no, everybody. Oh, okay. there we go. And that was just for the uh, for this cognitive task. Ah, I, see. I mean, for, and for the experiment, for doing the survey, of course. Yes. It's not for doing the meditation course. That, that, that's important. So the meditation course, uh, we didn't have to pay. Okay, then I start by showing you the effects of the training on the secondary outcome, which are already standardized. So these are interpreted in terms of uh, the coefficient and of standard deviations to see whether we can replicate previous results. So we're going to show you the effects of mental health, no cognitive skills and cognitive skills. And then I'm going to show you the effect of the training on average grades, also standardized, uh, standardized on the study program levels because the grades vary a lot depending on study programs. 
and we show you the immediate effect, the six months effect that we may want to talk about, robustness check, and then other outcome. And, in and finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanism. So first of all, representativeness, you may ask, okay, first question that I get a lot, you're going to probably going to have a very selected pool of subject. So I can tell you something about our selection based on the gender and age and the program. So these are the characteristics about all the faculty uh, of the entire faculty of the social science. And, um, and this is our sample. And basically what you have to get to get from this table is that, first of all, we have a little bit more women than the faculty. So 53% than 45, but actually I wouldn't expect much more. So I thought I would have only females, whereas that's not true. Uh, but we do have a little bit more females than, than the representatives. Um, and we have uh, fewer students in the business administration bachelor, so 21% rather than 31 compared to the, um, to the faculty overall, and we have a little bit more of uh, students on the social science more generally um, than, the, than the student of the faculty. But the differences are really not, are not really major, I would say. And age is quite representative. So I would say our sample is decent. It's not extremely selective. Also, you may want to say something about the medical health of our students. Well, this is what I can tell you. Uh, the average level of stress in our sample at baseline is basically 21 score based on the, on the scale, on the psychological scale that we use, which is considered moderate stress. And we were lucky enough to find that in a representative sample of 18,000 German university students, uh, a previous paper found that an average level of stress of almost 20, so it's very close. So it's not that our student, our sample is overly stressed as true. It represents more or less, uh, I would say, the, the representative stress and post in Germany. As far as anxiety, I cannot compare it. I don't know any kind of study that I could compare it with a representative sample in Germany, but I can tell you that the sample baseline was a nine which is considered as mild anxiety, and depression 9.49, which is considered mild slash moderate. In fact, mental health professionals use a score of 10 on the PHQ, PHQ-9 and GAD-7, which are the two measures that we use, as a cutoff when diagnosing individuals with depression or anxiety disorder, respectively. So our students are not diagnosed as being clinically anxious or depressed, but they are not far away from it, I would say. Okay, so let's go directly to the results. What are the effects on mental health? Here I'm showing you two regression for each outcome. The first one is a value added model. So where I basically control for the prior, for the previous uh, outcome at baseline. And then a first difference model. So the outcome variable is the difference between, for example, the stress after the intervention and the stress at baseline. Um, as you can see, in both uh, in both models, the results are very much robust. Uh, we find that the treatment, as you can see here, had a negative causal effect on stress. It reduces stress significantly. Also, anxiety, also depression. We also have in line with previous research. It also increased substantially self control, which I think it's nice because uh, sometimes uh, non cognitive skills are traits which cannot be changed. But in fact, we do find an effect on self control, on conscientiousness, and a reduction in neuroticism. Of course, these are self reported, so we have to take it with a grain of doubt. Uh, but the results seem, uh, I would say, definitely encouraging. Okay, what happens with the troop, troop task? This is again this exercise which was incentivized. I would say that, you know, depending on the specification, the effect can, can go up to a maximum of marginally significant. So I would say, if anything, the intervention marginally increased cognitive skills, certainly not reduced, but the effect um, is not so large. But in fact, it's actually consistent with recent literature by Vautier, I don't know the paper, and, all, and also the paper by Charnes and uh, Marie-Claire Vilval, which had also a, a laboratory experiment, uh, and they found a cognitive test, they found a really a marginal quality. So I think this is encouraging, which says, okay, our intervention is not really special or something. People is not to very picky thing for studies. Okay, what happens to the grade, however? So, ta-da, the grade, it was, yes. 
I, I teach a course of science of well being. I tell them how it's meant to take care of their mental health, and then I start to show them these results. <laughs> the <laughs> exam period is about to start. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, so the results are actually in the short term. Uh, they're not uh, so, so what, what I was hoping for. Uh, if I would say this way, again, depending on the specification, uh, you can see that you know if you use a first difference, you, you lose a, a significance. So it varies a bit. So I would say, if anything, the effects are negative. That's how it's a marginal negative effect on the effect on the ship. Certainly not positive. Uh, what happens, however, in the long term? Well, that's actually surprising because that is actually the opposite. So we find robust uh, across specification positive, actually pretty large because you know, it's in terms of standard deviation effects on academic performance. If I compare it to the literature on monetary incentives, actually this is pretty large because we typically find uh, a zero point uh, effect on standard deviation, zero point three, but this is zero point four. So, and the same results I can show you in terms of uh, distributions. This is the distribution of change in grades in the short and long run. So it's the basically the number of people who got a grade which improved, a short run grade which improved compared to the baseline. And these are the um, and a treatment group with black bar, the black, and the control is the little dots. As you can see, the distribution of the treatment is shifted to the left hand side. So they have a lower grade, whereas these are the, the, the um, this will the distribution of the delta grade long to so the difference between those who got uh, an improved reading grade in the long run compared to the baseline. As you can see here, um, the, the people in the treatment group are more more likely to have positive. Okay. If there are no questions. I will. So now one concern that typically come up, I just got a referee report, which uh, gave us hundreds, I mean, not hundreds, but uh, I'd say five or six very good suggestions on how to, on how to address attrition. Uh, unfortunately, I got it two days ago, so I couldn't already, I cannot show it to you yet. Uh, for the moment, uh, to show that this is not attrition, it's driving the result, I have three arguments. First one, the students who had a negative change in the short run are not more likely to have missing a long-term grade. So to drop out of the sample. Uh, we have already shown, I mean, I haven't shown you because of the lack of time, but I've told you that uh, treatment are balanced, even uh, if you observe a few grades in the long run. So we do observe like substantially lower grades in the long run because many people uh, finish, uh, finish study. But the third robustness checks um, that I have until now that I can show you is that I show that the results remain unchanged if I use the restricted sample. So if I restrict the analysis only to the sample, only to the subject for which I have both the short run and the long run grades. So this is here. And as you can see, the results, the fundamental results remain. So the negative short run effect and the positive long run. However, we're going to do more to try to address uh, attrition. So if you have also more suggestion, more than the one that the referee already got from the referee reports, uh, these are appreciated. Okay, so how about the medium term? I told you that there are also secondary session, which is in September. The effects are already positive. Um, again, not really significant. If I look at the big term, they're also positive, not significant. The sample size drops considerably. But if I pull them, in fact, we already find a positive effect already uh, in the period between September and December. Finally, you may ask, okay, but perhaps this increase in, in average grade could be um, um, compensated by a reduction in number of studies. Maybe people perform better but do less study or, or also quantity versus quality argument. We do not find evidence for this. So here I'm just uh, the main outcome uh, of, uh, of interest is the number of points, the number basically a proxy for the number of exams. And as you can see, if anything, the results are in the same direction, the fact that people do fewer exams in the short run uh, and more exams in the long run. So there is not this substitution effect between quality and quantity. Finally, um, some mechanism. So mechanism for the negative effect. I gave you three store, three reasons, exactly for why we could expect a positive, a negative, why there couldn't be a negative effect in the short run. The first one was, well, perhaps 
is stress, we reduce stress and people need to be stressed uh, to, to work better. Is that the, do we have evidence for this? We don't think, I think we can reject this argument based on two, uh, two reasons. First, we don't find any correlation between stress and grades at baseline. So stress doesn't seem to be a, a prediction of, of grades of performance at baseline. And we also don't find any correlation between variation in stress and variation in grades. So we don't think that this is what's, what is explaining the results. The second argument was intervention reduced the student motivation to study. Just focusing the present, I think, you know, I just want to enjoy now. Why should I think about studying? And so you're just not so motivated to study. We don't care so much about having a good grades. Again, we don't find evidence for this because if anything, in fact, as I told you, I have data on study behavior, the intervention improves study behavior, how much people feel they could concentrate, what they say called learning strategy and their self-concept, so maybe mission and confidence. And again, we don't find any correlation between variation in studies behavior, in students' behavior and variation in grades. Finally, the last uh, argument was, well, maybe the intervention requires students to learn a new practice and to adopt new daily habits. Like maybe, you know, they were required to meditate every day and to take this time out, which may take resources away from studying. And we think this is what's going on. And the argument for why we think this is going on is the following. First, uh, we find evidence that the intervention led to an increase in self-care practices and healthy behavior. I'm going to show you in particular, people sleep longer. And uh, um, say they want this time of time, this is that they spend more time relaxed and cautious. And which could you could say take resources away from studying because instead of a time, but also resources. If you cognitively decide, okay, I have to get these habits, perhaps then you are slack uh, in, 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 in getting yourself, okay, I'm going to study. If you think that our resources are limited and we cannot, you know, be super safely controlling everything that could, could be happening. The second reason is that variation in these healthy habits is the only significant predictor of variation in grades. Among all the pre-register variables, that's the only one that is significantly correlated. And finally, also from a theoretical point of view, it's the only story that would predict different dynamics over time, that in the short run, you need to learn these habits uh, and integrate them, but in the long run, then once this learning costs them taken and these habits have been integrated, they should disappear. Yeah, so with your second last bit of what you're saying, that more, more time on healthy habits gets worse grades. Yes, more time or more effort. I cannot tell you exactly time. I don't, I don't, uh, so I can't tell you it's, it's time. Exactly. I call it resource. It could be also effort. Yeah. So I cannot, I couldn't measure exactly how much time. I would imagine what you, what you might expect is there to be um, an inverse kind of linear relationship. So. Not enough self care is bad, but too much can be. Yes. But it'd be interesting to know if that's what you found and what the kind of middle is. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can tell you exactly. So, I'll show you what I have, and, and, and then you can tell me whether this, uh, this partly answer your question. But, um, yeah, let's see. Um, so, I, I, don't, I don't use the, I don't allow a quadratic, uh, a quadratic, uh, but. So let, let's go to, to, to what I see. So here, these are the, our healthy measure, our healthy behavior. We ask how much people drink, how much coffee we drink, tea, alcohol, smoking, medication, getting up, uh, getting up early, sleeping up late, relaxation, and the health index is putting them onto them. As you can see, the treatment reduced how much people drink coffee and tea, reduced uh, the probability that people go to sleep late, and increase people relaxation was you let's say you do you relax consciously. So how much people relax? So this, this it, it affected negative. So it affected positive in terms of more self-care practices, a higher health health index. And then, as I told you, I show the correlation between this variation of grade in the short term. So this is delta grade short term is the is a difference between your grade in the short term versus your grade of baseline. And I want to look at how it correlates. These are correlation, right? We're not making causal claim, but how it correlates compared to variation in trend compared to before and after the intervention in anxiety, depression. And as you can see, basically, aside from conscientiousness, which somehow the good on the other way around. So I still don't interpret very well this correlation. The only variable which which is which is correlated with this variation in grades is the health behavior, and in particular, if I, if I put them in all the items, 
the two the going to sleep late and relaxation, which were two of the of the variable which were affected the, by the treatment. They are the ones who are negatively correlated with variation in grades. Mainly going to sleep late actually is good for your grades. And uh, relaxing more is it's bad for your grades. Yes. If there is not say a linear heart rate in the constitution of an age express, should you expect their relation to that then? Um yes, so we we so we have a heterogeneity analysis to see, for example, if we find the heterogeneous based on stress, and we don't and we don't uh, and we don't find heterogeneity. However, I cannot tell you that this could also be due to a lack of power. I don't hundred percent yeah. So what would you suggest? Do? So well, you can add it for drastically. I mean, it's imperfect. Obviously, yeah. Uh, break out whatever the two two seconds of the domain for stress. I think that those two variables, like those stress. In this table, yeah. Exactly. So but we do this with the yeah, it's not quadratic. So we just create a dummy and look at the direction of the treatment, and I can show you. Exactly. Uh, we don't find. So you just the pathway is. Yeah, it's true. Okay, you're right that the, 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 the zero correlation could be due that this is that's not, that's not totally right. So maybe we can we can we can look at correlation depending on uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So this is for the short run. Um, for the long run, so unfortunately for the long run, we didn't have the questionnaire again after six months. Uh, so I cannot check the secondary outcome of the goal in the long run. So the best I can do is to look in the questionnaire, which was run at the end of the intervention, for a variable which could be indicative of whether people would be likely to continue practicing even after the intervention was over. And this variable, in our opinion, is a variable called own practice where we ask the student in the treatment group, in the last two months, how often had you meditated on your own beyond or independently of the course's exercise? And the, treat and the control group we ask, in the last two months, how often have you meditated on your own? I mean, they were not part of the group. And our conjecture is that we expect students who practice meditation beyond the training requirement to be more likely to continue practicing in the long run and therefore to benefit from the effect of the practice on their performance. We divide the subject between those who practice in the role who applied one, two, or three versus those who applied four. And this is what we find. So here we have uh, the treatment, and then here we interact the, inter the interaction of the treatment with own practice, yes, with the practice on their own. And as you can see, the positive effect, so this is positive and significant, and if I of in the long run, and if I look at the effect of the of the treatment on those who practice on their own. So by summing these two, uh, these two coefficients, um, they are highly significant. Whereas for those who do not practice on their own, who do not continue, actually the effects are negative also in the long run. Mm -hmm. In the sense that these are those who probably in the short run also didn't have a, they also didn't have a positive effect. In the long run, they didn't continue practice, so they didn't benefit from it. Whereas those who actually in the who continue practice in the long run, in fact, if anything in the short run is rather positive, and then it, it click on. So that one would benefit. And so whatever we randomly assign places in an eight-week mindfulness meditation training among interested students in university university students. Main finding our mindfulness meditation program improved mental health a bit cognitive and non-cognitive skill in the short run. If anything, the program decreased the short run academic performance, but it increased long run academic performance by about zero point standard deviation mechanism. Seems to be an increase in daily uh, self-care behavior, such as constant relaxation, which may be costly in terms of performance in the short run, but if you keep doing it, yeah, that it's improved. It's beneficial in the long run. Mindful meditation can have substantial positive spillover effect on performance, but it may take time before one can reap this benefit. I think that's one message of the paper. We, one could say, well, it works as any other human capital investment, which may take some time before you can earn the benefit. You have to invest in it at the beginning, and then you benefit afterwards. Um, more generally, policy implication, well, we, we think our study really is externally valid, so it fulfills the science condition. In terms of selection, I showed you that there is a lot of strong selection. 
uh, attrition, well, I have to work more on that. But I did also address, kind of address all the questions of attrition. Naturalness, I mean, this was run in the university, people were on campus, so it was something that can really, yeah, it was in a natural environment. And scalability, something that, you know, any university can do, they can even partner with, uh, with insurance and decide to offer these courses uh, to their students. I think that our results can inform university schools, but also business companies and other organizations that offer mindfulness meditation training to their employee. I also think that, uh, you know, there is an unclear relationship between mental health and performance. Certainly it's not so linear and homogeneous as one might think. We discussed the possibility that it's in fact, uh, uh, especially with stress, uh, okay? Uh, and in general, I think mental health and more generally well-being and performance should be considered separate goals of education that are possibly not aligned in the long run, in the short run. So I certainly, I'm not the fan of uh, necessarily have to selling that uh, we have to, that organization have to adopt well-being because it's increased performance, because I would like to see them as two different goals. And sometimes I think we should be ready to sacrifice performance in order to attain uh, such a goal. <laughs> I really feel it with my heart to what it is. Here, here. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, well, I think it's also our study uh, showed the importance of assessing the long run, uh, let's say medium run effects of intervention, because if you had stopped just at the, uh, and collecting measure only right after the intervention, we, should, we would have made very different conclusions. So uh, then if we, yeah, given that we collected those longer measures. Okay, so I think this is all on my side. Thank you for, for your attention and then for, for your comments. Thank you. Thank you.